Hi, my name is Christine and I'm Ava and we are both sophomores in high school. We are with Team 5757G, which is a part of the VEX Robotics Collaboratory, the umbrella group for all VEX 5757 teams. This is the first video in our PID control series for VEX Robotics Toss-Up. We hope you find it useful. We started our research and development efforts in the area of PID control in the summer of 2013. With this presentation, we are hoping to provide an educational resource for middle school and high school students participating in the VEX Robotics competition. In this presentation, first we explain what PID stands for and why we want to use it. Then we provide a brief overview of the PID control process. After that, we talk about the elements of PID namely the P, the I, and the D, and how they come together in various forms. We will then talk about our plan for using PID to better control our VEX toss-up robot. We wrap up this presentation by telling you how you can contact us if you have any questions or comments on our PID work. So let's start. What is PID? PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative. We will go into what those mean later. For now, know that PID is a software solution for controlling a system. Here's an example of a robot arm that we can control using PID. We want to raise the arm to a certain position, regardless of how much weight it's carrying. Here is the general overview of the PID process. You start with the target value, which is also known as your set point. Now let's say you want the arm to assume this position. So we can refer to this position as the set point. Imagine that the arm is initially on the ground, picking up the blue ball. That position on the ground is the initial process variable, because the process variable is the current position of the arm. You read the process variable using a sensor that is on the robot arm. And then the PID control process determines a new speed for the motor, based on the set point and that process variable. Every time you go around this loop, the speed of the motor will be different, so the position of the arm will change which will subsequently change the process variable as well. This process continues until the arm reaches its target position. In the previous slide, we mentioned the process box, which changed the speed of the motor, remember? So here is what is inside the box. There are three components, which we refer to as proportional, integral, and derivative. Each of these components is going to contribute to the speed of the motor in this process. Now we're going to go over each of these components one at a time, so we'll tell you about proportional, integral, and derivative. We begin with proportional control. This is the most basic and straightforward control of the three. So let's see how the motor speed is calculated using proportional control only. You want the arm to be here. This is your target position. Remember, we call this the set point. Initially, though, the arm is down here and we refer to the current position of the arm as the process variable. The difference between the set point and the process variable is called the error. In proportional control, you determine the speed of the motor by multiplying the error by a constant called proportional gain, or p-gain. This p-gain is problem dependent, and the process of determining its value is called tuning. We'll talk about tuning later on, but not in this presentation. In this example, using pseudocode, we're setting the p-gain to 0.3. But this is not to say that 0.3 is always the value for p-gain. Again, this number has to be determined by the tuning process. The software implementation of proportional control is rather straightforward. You have a while loop, and in this while loop, you calculate the error by subtracting the process variable from the set point. You determine the speed of the motor by multiplying the error by the p-gain. And this continues until the error becomes negligible, meaning that this loop keeps going until the arm reaches its target. This algorithm may seem simple, but there's more to it than meets the eye. The value of the p-gain can actually have drastic effects on the behavior of the arm, how fast or how slow the arm converges, or whether it converges at all. For example, here you can see four different p-gains, and how the arm behaves differently because of them in terms of the time it takes to reach its target position. To summarize, 
the accuracy with which the arm reaches its target position is highly dependent on the p-gain and the tuning process. Here is an example where no matter what p-gain you choose, the process variable never reaches the set point, or the arm never reaches its target position. This is a problem referred to as offset. Why does offset occur? It's because of something called disturbances, which is anything that alters the system's output. If we look at the robot arm, an example of a disturbance could be a heavy object being lifted and the additional load causing the arm to struggle. Well, why can't you just increase the p-gain, which increases the motor speed, just enough to be able to lift the arm with this object? That's because you are not always going to be carrying this object. You don't know when you're going to have a disturbance, so you can't just always assume that the required output is constant. The next element of PID is integral control. But what is an integral? Simply put, if you have a function fx, its integral is the area under the curve. Determining that area requires some knowledge of calculus, but you can simplify the calculation by approximation. Here's how to do it. You divide the region into rectangles of equal width. The height of a rectangle corresponds to the fx value. To get your integral value, you calculate the area of each of the rectangles and add them all up. In the example of our robot arm, let's see how the integral plays in. The arm will take a certain amount of time to get from the initial position to the target position, and at each time increment, we will have a different error value. The error at each time increment is the target position minus the current position. As you can see, over time, the error decreases. The integral is the sum of all of these errors. Similar to proportional control, here we determine the speed of the motor by multiplying the integral value by a constant called integral gain, or I gain. Like P gain, I gain has to be determined experimentally. Here's the pseudocode for using both proportional and integral control. As you can see, we're still using 0.3 for P gain, and we're using 0.2 for I gain. But remember, these are only sample values. The gains are problem specific and have to be determined experimentally. So here's the main loop for the PI proportional plus integral control. Once again, you calculate the error and then you determine the sum, which is your integral value. Now you determine the speed of the motor by using the equation shown here. You multiply the error by the P gain and add that to the integral value times the I gain. Here are two hypothetical graphs representing the behavior of the robot arm. The first one, which you have seen before, shows how fast the arm settles at its target position using purely proportional control. The second one shows the behavior of the arm with both proportional and integral control. As you can see, the arm hypothetically settles faster and with less oscillations. Here is another example of using PI control to improve performance. As we talked about earlier, use of only proportional control could result in a problem called offset when you will never reach your target value. Adding integral control could potentially eliminate this problem. Well, how is that? Let's recap. The problem of offset occurs when a disturbance causes the p-gain to no longer be sufficient for producing the desired output, right? Well, this gives you a static error, which is where integral control comes in. The system keeps adding the errors until the integral is large enough to overcome the offset. So we know that proportional and integral control seems to work pretty well together, but why can't we use pure integral control? Here's an example of what might happen if we do. This graph represents the behavior of a hypothetical control system, and as you can see, this system will never settle out. This is caused by something called wind-up. When the system spends a lot of time in saturation, which is when you push the system's output past the boundaries of what it can produce, the integral value grows, or winds up to very large values. So when you reach the target, the integral value is still very large, so the system overshoots past its target while the integral unwinds, or decreases. This causes the process to reverse and overcorrect, forcing the system to oscillate and never reach its target value. The last element of PID is derivative control. Well, what is derivative? 
In context of the robot arm, the derivative would measure how fast the arm changes position, or how fast the error increases or decreases. Simply put, a derivative measures the rate of change of a function. In this case, the function describes the position of the arm. Determining the derivative requires some knowledge of calculus, but we can simplify the calculation by approximating. Here's how to do it. In the example of our robot arm, let's see how the derivative part will work. As you can see here, as the arm moves up, the error decreases. If we graph the errors at different time intervals, we will end up with something like this graph. This graph represents a function. Let's call it the error function. The question is, what is the derivative of the error function at a given time interval? If you're looking at the interval where the time starts at t1 and ends at t2, you can see that the error changes from p1 to p2. Therefore, the derivative can be approximated using this equation, p2 minus p1 over t2 minus t1. This shows that the derivative is the rate of change of the error with respect to time. Similar to the other two controls, here we determine the speed of the motor by multiplying the derivative value by a constant called derivative gain, or d gain. Here's the pseudocode for using proportional, integral, and derivative control. We're still using 0.3 for p gain and 0.2 for i gain. And now, we're also using 0.1 for d gain. But again, these values are problem specific and have to be determined experimentally. Here is the main loop for the PID control. Once again, you calculate the error, and then you determine the sum, which is your integral value. Then, you calculate the change in the error, denoted by delta E. This is your derivative value. You determine the speed of the motor by using the equation shown here. You multiply the error by the p-gain, add that to the integral value times the i-gain, and add that to the derivative value times the d-gain. The first two graphs, which were shown earlier, hypothetically illustrate how p and pi control work. Now that we've learned about derivative control, the very last graph at the bottom gives you a good idea of what PID control looks like altogether. Because proportional control deals with the present behavior of the system, and integral control deals with the past behavior, you can now address the future output with derivative control. By having this rate of change element, or the output's projected slope, the speed at which the system reaches its target can be further increased while oscillations are reduced. Here you can see that the system using PID control reaches the target input the fastest and settles out almost immediately. You can see from these graphs that, as a whole, PID control theoretically produces a swift response and effectively keeps the output stable. But there's a problem that we haven't discussed yet, which could occur with both proportional and derivative control. This problem is called noise. Noise which actually has nothing to do with sound, is simply quick random changes in the input signal that creates rapid fluctuations in the error. Now, noise is a random error, and there are multiple things that could potentially cause it, such as vibration or electrical interference. The end result is a continuous degradation of signal quality and the system's inability to generate an accurate output. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, PID consists of three different elements, proportional, integral, and derivative. As you have seen before, we can determine the speed of the motor of the robot arm by combining the results of these three components. However, this may not be the case for every problem. Depending on the problem, you have to find a suitable combination. This could be one, two, or three of them. For example, P, PI, PD or PID. We hope to be able to cover this topic in more depth in our next presentation in this series. Now you must be wondering, how are we planning on implementing PID control specifically on our VEX robot? Well, an issue that we're currently experiencing is controlling our scissor lift. As you can see here, when the lift is raised, it has a tendency to go up unevenly. By applying PID control, 
we hope to be able to raise both sides of the scissor lift to a target position quickly and steadily. Another area that we plan to address is robot navigation. Because of overshooting and coasting, our robot never seems to end up exactly where we want it to. Whether it's momentum or a varying battery voltage that's causing the robot to drive that extra unwanted distance, the overshooting is never constant. This is where the PID control comes in. The proportional and integral control should maintain the robot speed driving towards the target location, while the derivative action projects a slower speed as the robot approaches that location, therefore preventing any coasting. So, in conclusion, using PID control would not only allow us to more precisely manipulate our robot, but also to retain speed and efficiency. Thank you for listening to our presentation on the basics of PID control. Please feel free to leave questions or comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also contact us at our email or comment in our blog.